Aloha Wise Askers. Wisdom Keepers. Uh, people of the Wise? I don't know. It's Jeremy. I uh, was going to do, well, I still am going to do a show tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Hawaiian time, and I realized, well, I didn't uh, actually say a.m. or p.m. That's a.m. So <laughs> Tuesday at 11.30 a.m., I will be back on here with a slightly more formal chat. But uh, I wanted to let you know that. And also, I saw the Mindful Monday question about whether or not social media uh, is good or bad or what. Um, so I thought maybe I'd talk about that for a second and recontextualize it a bit. Uh, because I think the, uh, the answers on both sides are generally going to be valid. There's going to be people who say that social media, uh, is good because it connects us with our family and it lets us meet new people and we can speak all over the world and, and, um, you know, create um, support networks, uh, find your tribe, um, you know, support people, you know, even in times of war, trying to get their message out of please help us or, you know, whatever the po political uh, boycott of the day is, you know, these sorts of things. There are all sorts of ways in which social media is, is good. And there are all sorts of ways in which it is bad, uh, such as, um, you know, disinformation, <laughs> right? Like, uh, sometimes tr finding your tribe means forming a bubble and not listening to anyone else. And then when the fascists get a hold of that bubble, well, then they really manipulate you. And it, um, obviously through the anonymity, we develop internet muscles, right? Where we can sort of be all id and, uh, bully each other and be cruel and all that stuff without any real world repercussions. It's also bad in that it's not a substitute. I mean, it is obviously we use it this way, but it's not a really good substitute for, cause there is none for real world relationship in person relationship. And you can tell that in part by the fact that you would never say those bullying things to someone's face. Although now even that is starting to break down, right? Like uh, the barrier between what you would never do in someone's face and what you would is getting thinner and thinner. Um, and this we call evolution, right? It's pretty unfortunate. So there's, there's stuff to be said on either side. And usually the happy middle ground is to say it's whatever you make of it. Social media isn't bad. It's how you use it. That's bad. And that's the part I want to focus on. That's incorrect to, in an extent or from a certain perspective. Um, and we hear this with all sorts of things, right? We hear that like science, there is no bad science or good science. It's just how you use it. Like we've got this imaginary world where the perfect human is a logical robot, like, like Spock from Star Trek, right? Like that, that at least used to be kind of our ideal human is like, you know, think purely with thought and without emotion. And if you can achieve that, then everything you do will be a rational decision based on the merits of fact or whatever. And that ain't what we are. And that isn't, and thankfully that isn't what we are. I mean, we're, we're so much more than that. Uh, the downside is we're so much more than that. <laughs> so jokes aside, I, I think you cannot, uh, detach the mind that produces these dichotomies from the dichotomies. You can't detach. In other words, we've got a mind uh, that swings back and forth on a pendulum between like right and wrong, good and bad, ethical, unethical, moral, not moral, you know, all of that. And then of course the definitions of those things change throughout the years too with society. But the pendulum is the pendulum there, there. It's always going to be back and forth. We're always going to be, you know, politically going from right to left to right to left to left to right to left. It's just the way it is. And so there is, a, so again, there is no, there is no person divorced from the technologies and the ways of exploring the universe, even through science 
that is divorced from all of that. Uh, so it's easier to see with science, maybe like with science, science is funded by, uh, well, it'll be funded by universities and corporations and the military. These are the big three, right? And so it's whatever those things demand, which is usually has to do with making money or making weapons. And that is the root of how our science gets done. So there is no altruistic scientist who just observes life as it is and, and <laughs> reports back on what's repeatable, right? Like, like, no, it's always in service to something uh, awful <laughs> uh, at this point, at least. And also the scientist is not a pure, you know, observer. There's just no such thing. This idea of like an objective observer divorced from their feelings and from their cultural background and all of that. There's no such thing. So we can idealize science and scientists all we want. We can do the same with social media. We can idealize that it's just however you you treat it, but the fact is it is an extension of that mind. And so it's always going to have the bad characteristics along with the good characteristics. And so the bigger question to me isn't, is it good or bad? The bigger question is, um, do we have to be operating from, from this mind? As we're operating from this mind, obviously it is better to do good science than bad science. Obviously it is better to not harm people than harm people. Obviously it is better to use social media for social good than social ill or personal gain uh, in a bad way, I suppose. I mean, there's good personal gain and there's bad personal gain. But is that mind real? Do we need to be in that mind? Because we sort of neglect the question by just saying, you know, all of this back and forth pendulum swinging, that's just human nature. That's the tides of history, right? Um, is it? I mean, it is, that's the way we treat it, but need it be that way is the question. So I guess I'll just throw that out there for you. Um, can we, can we subvert the smaller question of like, is social media good or bad with does such a mind that creates social media, can it be divorced from itself in such a way that um, it only uses social media for good? Or is it always going to be just drenched in the bad? Um, because let's face it, this thing that we call human nature, when we talk about aspects of human nature, such as love, we do include, we don't say it out loud, out loud we say we don't do this, but in practice, we include jealousy, desire, anger, uh, you know, facets of hatred and neediness. We often meet each other in fact, more times than not, with our psychological dysfunctions. And we try to seek out people who are, you know, compatibly dysfunctional with us. And that's how you can create like an enabler re relationship or a hierarchical relationship. Someone's always got to be the low person on the totem pole, right? If we just take for granted that that is what our mind is and how do we navigate that to the best of our ability and then call it a day, uh, what if we're not that? What if that all of that is is delusional, but is nevertheless how we treat ourselves and therefore what we are in the world? Like you can't get away from the reality that that is how we are in the world, but must we be that way? And if we are not to be that way, and yet we are that way, what does it take to not? What it takes to not be doing something <laughs> that we're doing is to not do it anymore. And in this case, to be silent, to, uh, to just stop altogether this projecting of such a self into the world, which is scary because you don't know what will happen next. But the only way to be a scientist and test it out is to do it for the sake of doing it without, without even wanting to know what comes next, which, you know, again, seems sort of antithetical. To, like you want to be motivated to find out what's next, but you have to even throw that motivation away. Are we willing to do that? Because if we're not willing to do that, on and on we go on the pendulum. Anyway, that's my take. Uh, if anyone wants to say hi, feel free. If not, I will call it a day. Should I count down from 10?
Is there going to be dead air? 10, 9, getting sleepy, 8, 7, sleepy. Oh, wait, now I'm just hypnotizing you. All right, forget it then. I will see you tomorrow, 11.30 a.m., Hawaiian time. How does technology change our sense of aliveness? Well, uh, there are two types of technology. The first is practical, which is like a can opener, you know, something that you can't really do on your own, (laughs) opening a can. Uh, And then the other is like uh, something we invent as a metaphor, an unconscious metaphor for what we're not living, that we actually need to be living internally. And that would be something like the Internet, where we have replaced um, the web of life with the World Wide Web. So we're not interconnecting with nature. We're divorced from nature and we're divorced from each other primarily. Um but that's internally. So externally, we've developed an artificial version of that where we can interconnect through wiring and technology. And so um, that changes our sense of aliveness insofar as we decide to solely live there and not see it as a metaphor and only be external and not work on the internal. Aloha, wise askers. It's Jeremy Vaney. Doing an impromptu bit of a show here. Um, feel free to join me if you like. On mainstreaming offensiveness. First, I just want to give you a little update. Living here on the big island of Hawaii, on Mauna Loa, which uh, has been erupting. And I- I'm conflicted about how things are going. Because on the scientific level, it looks as though it uh, is stopping. And in fact, Kilauea, we just got an update that Kilauea, the other perpetually erupting volcano in Volcanoes National Park, funny enough, no coincidence, is uh, also, has also quieted. So that sounds good, except that I'm pretty sensitive to the island in certain ways that I don't really know what it means. And so the for instance would be, for instance, uh, sometimes at night, um, it, I will hear and feel a low hum sort of rumbling noise. And it would be like if you live in the city and you, you'll you know what I'm talking about. Like if you live on like, I don't know, a, a high floor on an apartment building and you, you feel and hear a large truck in the street down below or if somebody's blasting their bass music in a car, you know, several blocks away, but you can still kind of feel it in your chest and you can kind of hear it, it's that. Except there ain't no cars around here and no trucks and it's intermittent through the night. Uh, not intermittent like long intervals, but just I'll hear it and I'll feel it and then it'll stop for a few seconds then I'll hear it and feel it. Well, last night that was going on for much of the night uh, and I fell asleep and I got up to go to the bathroom. And when I came back to bed, I could, it was still there. I was still like hearing this and feeling this. And I tend to think that that is, uh, I, I guess I've always sort of thought of that as possibly lava moving uh, beneath me in the ground below. Um, I have a Hawaiian elder friend, <laughs> a Kapuna who. Uh, you know, I described some of these feelings that I've had to her, and she said, this is what, uh, you know, Hawaiians in tune with Hawaii would feel. Now, I'm not Hawaiian, but it may just be that it, for whatever reason, I'm in tune this way. But I described the things that she said, you know, sort of validated as, yes, this is this is what you're hearing, and it does pretend to something uh, lava-related. So last night, like I'm saying, I was feeling this humming in, in not my chest, but in my backside, really, um, because I was lying down on my back, I suppose. And you just feel it. You can feel the vibration. You can hear, you can hear it. And it's kind of annoying because it does remind me of like a truck in the distance or something. Um, but it was for so long because usually it like stops after a while, but this was going on for so long that I don't know. I'm just, you know, maybe lava is magically draining out of the volcano. I don't know. But I just tend to think that even though scientifically it looks as though Mauna Loa has quieted um, or, or is about to completely stop erupting and Kilauea has in fact stopped 
you know, like overnight, that maybe this is a quiet period to building up to something else. I guess that's not a fear necessarily, but um, a concern, and it will be interesting. Let's see what happens. Put it to the test, because again, all signs are pointing to this is over, this eruption. But um, we'll see. <laughs> Um, and if it is over and, um, then that means that whatever this feeling is that happens sometimes at night, uh, isn't related to that. And so now I've got to figure out what the hell it is and I'll report back to you if I ever do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if I live, if I live through this. Um, so I want to talk about mainstreaming offensiveness. Uh, this was just something that I riffed off of. Um, you know, there was like a, one of those wisdom app mindful Monday or something. I don't know what, uh, you know, questions that go out in general about is social media good or bad. And I just want to tug on that thread again a little bit, but change the question to is the internet at large good or bad? Uh, which I know is a weird thing because here we both are on, uh, on the internet, funny enough. And, uh, we're not bad people, right? Let's hope. <laughs> but, uh, no. Uh, so I guess the point is like what we say we will use the internet for uh, all the sort of altruistic stuff um, is usually a fantasy, right? So we talk about like sustaining and furthering relationships at a distance. And uh, in the case of social media, of course, um, but in the internet, it, in the internet at large, we talk about learning more, right? Like you've got everything, all knowledge at your fingertips. Um, and you know, it used to get idealized as something that would contribute to the better furtherance of, of human knowledge, um, and us in general, like we, it was all like, it was sold to us as like, you know, interconnectivity and knowledge, <laughs> which it kind of is, except it's actually like porn and bullying now. Right. <laughs> like, like a lot. Uh, but these are the lies that we told ourselves that we would, you know, to build this up as not just a, a new industry. Um, but you know, it, it is a way of life. I mean, there are people alive now younger than me who can't imagine what life was like before the internet. Um, you know, I guess the other thing that we, we always said the internet was supposed to be for was like, uh, it was sort of democratic, right? It was the democratization of communication, of news, of all of that. And you could put yourself out there uh, and be seen and heard um, for free, basically. But then everything got monetized, right? Because um, you know corporations are always going to come in. This is what I don't understand. Why do we always have amnesia about corporations coming in? Like, you remember when uh, like everyone wanted, you know, well, they still do, uh, in America at least, want like pot legalized. And you have to like pretend that you want it legalized for medicinal purposes or because uh, you care about the prison population or whatever it is, you know, but it was always like my pothead friends who were quote unquote caring about these issues when really they just wanted to smoke pot legally. Right. Like, and I'm not saying that's everyone, but that's a lot of people. Uh, but also, you know, the, the, the sense of freedom that you could grow it on your own or whatever. And it's like, well, you know, as soon as it's legalized, it's going to be taken over by giant corporations and it's going to be restricted. The laws will get rewritten so that it's still illegal for you to grow it. But, uh, but you can, you, you know, you can buy the big giant corporation version, which will inevitably be poisoned in some way. I mean, we know this, right? Like wash, rinse, repeat. And yet we always have this like, idealistic uh, naivete every time we go into something new like that. Um, and so back to the internet, <laughs> you know, uh, we sold ourselves a beautiful dream essentially of what this thing would be. And, you know, we wouldn't have been sold on it if we didn't believe in it in ourselves at one point, but changing one's psychology to accommodate the better angels of technology that secretly holds a bunch of devil stuff. And I don't mean that literally, uh, waiting to tap into your real desires is like crash dieting or quitting heroin cold Turkey, right? Like the odds of recidivism are, uh, pretty great. Inevitably. Um, so, 
you know, what we tend to use the internet for is not the idealistic stuff that we talk about. In other words, it's the stuff we desire. It's the stuff we really want, not the positive wants we wish we had, right? Those are the, th the ideals are the things that we wish we had. They're the things that we keep outside ourselves and say, someday we're going to achieve those ideals, but not today. It's ideals are procrastination, essentially. And when it comes to the internet, uh, you know, let's look at what we actually want, because what it actually is, is what we want. And mainly, we want it to be, we want to be offensive. We want to break taboos, and this naturally makes us defensive. And so when we behave this way for however many hours of the day, we lose our vulnerability. Our sense of vulnerability becomes a dirty word, right? Like the dirty words aren't the dirty words anymore because we're using them all because, you know, we're breaking the taboos and we're feeling good and we're letting our id out, you know, we're letting that, that inner jerk run wild. Um, but then our vulnerability becomes like, which is truly us, uh, becomes this thing that we have to sort of block off from the world or else. Now, there are a lot of people who still only use the internet casually or briefly, and many don't use it at all. We get that, right? And there are many more still who can compartmentalize their behavior and only be super offensive and defensive online, yet they'll remain socially acceptable offline. Like you can, you know, there are some people who can just be jerks online <laughs> and know how to, know how to turn that off when they, uh, when they turn the computer off. Um, but this causes insular bubbles to form with those who have practically lived online, uh, who can't believe most people don't believe what they believe or won't want to vote for the can their candidate because they only hang out with like minds, right? So there are people, you, you, maybe you are them, maybe you know them, who, uh, you know, can't believe, well, for instance, can't believe that Joe Biden won. But just look at the irony of this. Like, if you're political at all, whether you're on the light, right or the left, the whole um, living in a bubble thing has always been something that uh, liberals were accused of. Liberals live in a bubble. They live in a, a university bubble. They're educated and not real. They have no street smarts and blah, blah. And there's a lot to that that is true. Uh, but now... I guess we get to have b bubbles of equality because now Republicans have become absolutely bonkers in, in their insular bubble of raging infotainment uh, where they don't believe elections because like an orange criminal told them not to, uh, which is one thing, but then to not like part of what fosters that is that, they're so in a bubble, they can't believe that the rest of us don't believe that. Like, they can't believe that the majority of the country actually didn't vote for the criminal. Right? Like, that's weird. That, like, it's one thing to like the criminal and vote for a criminal and whatever, but to actually believe that you're the majority simply because all you hang out with or listen to or, you know, surround yourself with online mainly are people of like mind is not just nuts, but it's exactly what you were just accusing liberals of doing. And you were correct. And now we're correct too. <laughs> so there you go. Um, so I, I don't know. I, it just seems like, uh, I'm, I'm trying to read through. I, I had a little note here about this. Turns out you can achieve the same little to no education as well. You just have to create that social bubble and it becomes self-reinforcing. And that's what we've used the internet to do. So is the internet worth risking losing our vulnerability? I guess I've buried the lead with this very unprofessional live stream here. Um, that's the question. Is the internet worth risking losing our vulnerability? After all, one needs to be vulnerable, completely honest for truth to be the case. So I'm bringing that question up a level. There's the normal just sort of question of like, is it worth losing our vulnerability? Uh, do you think? But then it's self-answering when it comes to bigger so-called spiritual topics like truth, 
which is that you have to be vulnerable. You have to be open and honest and innocent for truth to be the case. You don't have to be that to talk about truths. You don't have to be that to talk about them in religious contexts um, or philosophical or any sort of intellectual whatever, or to have beliefs about them. Um, but in the way that I've talked about it previously on, on this app and on my podcast, or on doing radio and wherever the hell else I blab, um, it, it's, it's bad enough that everything is us, you know, sort of setting up our worldview to block out this higher sense of what we are, to not transform, in other words, to not blossom fully into what a real adult human would be. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's bad enough that we've like relegated certain people and icons to that status, religious and otherwise, and said, those are the ideals. Once again, Jesus, Buddha, whoever, you know, Let's put them up on a pedestal and say, that's the ideal to strive to be like, but never actually be. We'll be Christ-like. We'll never be Christ. We'll be Buddhist-ist, but you're not the Buddha. Um, but why not? If those things are also you, if these people um, were explaining to us what we actually are when we are out of the way, <laughs> what actually becomes of us when this, you know, shallow self, or maybe in Jesus's case, I don't know, sinner self or something, uh, different strokes for different cultures, I guess. Uh, when that cultural construct is shattered, who's, who's there? And you can't shatter what, what ain't vulnerable. And so to completely take away our sense of vulnerability Um, to make that the taboo thing to show in life um, through the bullying stuff, but also, you know, and through the fear of being bullied, but also just in our culture, you know, we have this thing where we don't like judgments, where we want everything to be relative. It's like we've taken Einstein's case of relativity and said, oh, yeah, that should apply socially, too. You know, like all points of view are equal, are relatively equal to the, the person and blah, blah, blah. Um, therefore, let's not judge anything. Therefore, whatever I'm doing is right, is correct, is perfect. Uh, and whatever you're doing is separate but equal, right and correct and perfect. Um, and this is only the case insofar as all, all of those right and perfect points of view um, are not truth. And therefore they're all equally incorrect. <laughs> they're all wrong. <laughs> like, you know, not in a judgy way, but in like a little kids running around and like, you know, smacking each other and, you know, dry humping the banister and, uh, you know, pulling the tail on the cat and sitting there and be behaving, being well behaved, you know, like all these things kids do the whole gamut of like awful to great things that little children do and we forgive all of it and we find all of it endearing uh, at the same time because they're kids. They don't know any better. They aren't adults. Well, from the point of view of truth, it's the same kind of thing. It's like um, one who is of truth has compassion for, you know, the rest of us, <laughs> but, uh, but also knows what we don't, which is that, uh, you know, we aren't the adults in the room, even if we think we are. So all of our points of view are great, but that doesn't make them truth, in other words. Um, so how do we get there in a culture that is receding further and further into its own defensiveness, into the buildup of its own case for itself as the pinnacle of consciousness for humanity, as we're doing with science? Um, like it's one thing for, you know, religions to bash each other over the head to sort of like joust for power. It's another for like science to come along and say, okay, well, we trounce all of that and, um, and, uh, because in some way we can legitimately 
trounce like the old, the old school, you know, old timey politics that are incorporated into religion and, and the, the outdated social values and some of the really awful things that were written in various Bibles that we all like to ignore because we can address those. And because science works on the level that it does work, um, we can then, I guess, just sort of put it out there that, that logic and rationality are the, uh, are, are the pinnacle of humanity. Like we've trumped religious thought and emotionality and, um, and we're it. Uh, but they're not it, right? Like that's wrong. And, uh, and in fact, they suffer from the same problems. Um, I mean, here's a divergent tangent, but I, I was just watching, uh, Oh, what's his name? God, I don't know. One of the, you know, one of the physicists that they trot out to like be a public speaker and he goes on Joe Rogan, uh, now and then, uh, He's supposed to be sort of the the bridge between we the riffraff and the scientist, but he instead he really is more of an elitist gatekeeper. Um, and I can't remember his name, but he was on Joe Rogan and he was talking about psychedelics. And Joe Rogan had asked him, uh, "Do you have you ever used psychedelics?" And he said, "No, he would never because he doesn't want to lose control, and because uh, he doesn't find anything useful comes out of." the testimony of those who have taken psychedelics and the way he says it with such smarm and is like, like I'm not a big fan of psychedelics either for different reasons, but this to me is the equivalent of the priest not looking through the telescope, right? Like how can you make, how can you say that there's nothing useful if you haven't done it? How can you say as he did that it is all in the brain? It may be all in the brain, but you should really do it before you make that call. But again, it's like the priest refusing to look through the telescope, except ironically, he's a scientist uh, pretending to be the one with the telescope, uh, pretending to care about what's through that scope. Um, but it gets back to the first thing he, he mentioned, which is he doesn't want to lose control. I mean, that's just it. The second that you are... you are immersed in something that is broader than you, um, a high dose of DMT of hallucinogenic, you know, substance brings you into a state of being transcended and included so that your own inner voice is this tiny voice in the back going, Oh my God, help or whatever you're saying. And in the foreground is this imaginative cartoonish, uh, seemingly sentient, bunch of stuff happening at you. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't honestly consider psychedelics spiritual or, or any of that. Uh, you know, we can get into that on another show if you want. Um, but, uh, but still that you don't want to lose control that you don't want to be transcended and included means really you don't want to even lose your, your place on the, the social hierarchy as the scientist, as the one who is the observer, you know, doing all the observing. I mean, there ain't no observer doing observing when you're, when you're out of control in that state, you're observing, but like, <laughs> it's different. Uh, everything's alive and, and bigger than you and you know it and there's nowhere to hide. Uh, so, but I think that psychedelics, I guess in that way can be, um, useful, uh, to see the world differently that way. Just don't, don't get locked into them cause they're not a crutch. Um, but also the idea that there's nothing useful brought back as information because the only useful information he could, he could comprehend would be like scientifically useful as opposed to the psychologically useful PTSD um, where people have, you know, sit down chats with entities that are interested in helping them through their psychological baggage. Now, if that is just your, your own brain or yourself splintering off in some, you know, schizophrenia, multiple personality episode, fine. <laughs> you know, if you can put that genie back into the bottle, as soon as the DMT wears off, great. Then you've helped yourself. Why isn't that 
worth doing, whether it's in the brain or not. Uh, I don't understand, except in terms of like, oh, right, we're not supposed to be vulnerable anymore. We're supposed to be self-assured. We're supposed to be offensive. We're supposed to be defensive. Anyway, that's, uh, I guess that's my little tangent here. Uh, if anyone wants to join in and talk about this or talk about anything else, feel free to click that button. Um, otherwise, I'm going to go ramble into my pillow. No, I, 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 don't, I don't know. <laughs> anyone, anyone, anyone want to say hi? Anyone have anything on their mind? Questions, comments, arguments, uh, whatever it is, it's fine. It's all good. Um, I know someone had asked me through that little one minute thing that you can do, you know, the like little one minute question and answer things, um, about co-hosting with me. And I don't know, there is no way on this app, right? There's no way to like have your address out there or set up a calendar time to do that with people, which is a shame. So I hope, you know, wisdom app people, if you're listening, you know, you should really look into that. Uh, but if anyone does want to set up some sort of like co-host thing in the future, you can write to me, Jeremy, J E R E M Y at our undoing.com. And hopefully that email will get to me <laughs> and then we'll set it up. Um, anywho, here's your food, uh, for thought. That's it. I'm out. Peace.